So I teach philosophy, and you may wonder what exactly philosophy means. Philosophers actually argue about this all the time, so that tells you something about what philosophy is. Um, my favorite definition is what my daughter Zella told us in first grade. She was trying to explain what I do to her friends, and she called it really hard guessing. <laughs> it's a great definition. I love it because the questions I care about in philosophy are really hard but I think they're important to human life, and I think they resist proof and certainty in the answering. So in that spirit, I want to give you some of my best guesses about what hope is today. So I think hope is a virtue. I think it's a virtue that helps us grapple with the temptation of despair. And as all the virtues, it's like a skill. It's something you have to work at over your whole life so you can rise to the challenge that despair represents when everything falls apart. So it may seem old-fashioned or quaint to talk about virtues, um, but I mean something very specific by it. At least since Aristotle, the virtues have been the personal qualities that make good people good people. So good people have a lot of excellent personal qualities, right? You might be a great piano player, you might be able to cook an excellent birthday cake. Um, but none of those are virtues, because the virtues have to be things that make life better for everybody. They have to be personal qualities that help us deal with a characteristic challenge of being human. So courage is a virtue, because fear is a universal human experience. And fear doesn't go away. So courage is something you have to develop over your lifetime. A lot of the challenges that the virtues help us deal with also function as a form of temptation, a temptation to do the wrong thing. So courage is a temptation, well, sorry, <laughs> fear is a temptation to do the wrong thing. It's to sit down, stay silent, or go home when goodness demands that we speak up, we fight back. Despair functions as a temptation just like fear. Now why? Well, everybody has failures. No matter what your vision of the good and meaningful life is, there's times when everything falls apart. And in those moments, we have a psychological challenge we have to grapple with. Was it my fault? Could I have done anything different? This is where despair tempts us. Because despair is the self-counsel that you couldn't have done anything better, right? That meaning and goodness were not attainable. In fact, they might just be illusions. And this is comforting, because it lets us off the hook. So hope is the virtue we need to grapple with this temptation. Now, like all, all the virtues, I think, uh, function very much like the skills of being a good person. And in particular, they take patience, trial and error, and a long time to develop. Right? So when she's not giving us excellent definitions of philosophy, one of the things Zella's doing is she's learning to play the piano. And when she makes a mistake and she gets frustrated, we have to teach her that mistakes are an opportunity for growth, and this is what learning something new is like. It's the growth mindset. She's not supposed to say, I can never do this, but I haven't learned how to do this yet. We need a growth mindset for the virtues also. So just because you didn't hope here, right, or you gave in to this despair, you have to keep trying. And I hope you leave the talks today with the idea that hope is possible and worth pursuing and you want to cultivate your own sense of hopefulness. But part of framing hope as a virtue shows us that it's not just a choice. It's not just a decision to be hopeful. You have to work out your hope muscle, so to speak. You have to practice so that when despair tempts you, you're up to the challenge. It's also important to think about what happens when a skill goes well. So when Zella performs at a recital, she does a great job, we celebrate. She's not done. She hasn't finished acquiring the skill of piano, right? In fact, it doesn't matter how excellent you become. So there's a story that's probably true that Pablo Casals, a cello player, when he was 81, somebody asked him, why do you still practice for four to five hours a day? And his simple answer was, I think I'm making progress. <laughs> so virtues are the same way. <laughs> Hope is a lifelong relationship you develop to the temptation to despair. And you should celebrate successes, of course, 
but no virtue is complete until your life is complete. So I've been talking about despair in a relatively straightforward way, but the truth is I think despair is tricky. I think it can get in in surprising ways. So in particular, um, if you have a fixed mindset about what makes life meaningful and good, and that mindset becomes unrealizable in the real world, it can lead you to despair. And I think this is one of the things going on with people on both sides of our political spectrum today. So for example, two days after Donald Trump was elected president, Garrison Keillor wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post. And he said, among other things, we liberal elitists are completely off the hook now. Republicans are in charge, they're responsible for everything. We should go for a nice brisk walk and smell the roses. This is the attitude of despair I expect from a kid on a playground who wants to take their ball and go home because they lost a game. But I think it gets in here because Keeler can't imagine what a good public political life would look like with Donald Trump as president. On the other side, the very slogan of the Trump candidacy, right, make America great again, it's based on a mythical view of what America is that was never true and certainly will never be true in the future. I think it's really telling that this MAGA viewpoint is associated with denying the reality of climate change. You can be so caught up in a fixed mindset about what's meaningful and good that you will ignore natural forces that are tearing the world apart around you. In both cases, I think a rigid, dogmatic mindset about what's meaningful and good is leading to tremendous despair. If a millennial tweets at you, OK, boomer, they might just be trolling you but they might be saying something very much like this, right? That your notion of the meaningful and the good is inadequate to the swiftly changing world they see in front of them. They need something more radical to have hope. So I'm a Gen Xer and I'm a little caught in between here, but I think the millennials are right. I think we need to cultivate a more radical hope. So a hope that would survive in a world we don't yet understand. So I think of radical hope as the commitment to live a meaningful and good life according to standards of meaning and goodness that we haven't created yet together. This may sound daunting, but I think in reality, humans rise to this challenge all the time. So one of the places I'm lucky enough to teach philosophy is with the Prison University Project inside San Quentin State Prison. And if you ended up in San Quentin, I think it's safe to say that whatever your vision of meaning and goodness in life, it's fallen apart. As one of my students wrote, sort of reflecting on when he first came to prison, he said he was dis disillusioned with everything. He had lost his ethic. So that's true, and yet every day I'm there, I see men who are striving to live good and meaningful lives inside one of the worst places we ever built. I think, in general, that we are far more confident than we ought to be about what meaning and goodness will look like in the far future. We need to avoid what Daniel Dennett has called the philosopher's syndrome. Now, he calls it mistaking a lack of imagination for necessity. I think we need to be careful here when we project from our current notions of meaning and goodness onto a future that's been radically altered by climate change. And then we think despair is warranted because our vision of the good life can't be achieved there. The truth is we are reliably bad at predicting what it would be like for us to be in a different form of life. Psychologists will teach us about hedonic adaptation, the idea that your um, level of happiness is surprisingly resilient even when very bad or very good things happen to you. And I'd like to take that and generalize it and suggest to you that your notions of meaning and goodness are philosophical ideas. And as Zella will tell us, that's just guessing. Now, there are good and bad guesses, of course, but guessing can't possibly generate the certainty that would justify despair. So the only rational response, then, to the radical challenge of climate change is an attitude infused with radical hope. I think anything else would be epistemically arrogant, assuming that we know what life will be like for our kids or our children's children, and we just don't. Living in a world that we don't yet understand is fundamentally an act of creation, of art, poetry, dreaming. And in my experience, young people are always already leading the way here. Meaning and goodness have flourished in the past many times through the destruction of a way of life, and I think they will again in the future. Thank you so much for listening.
Thank <laughs> you.